Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we go ahead and jump straight on into the lesson this evening. Go ahead and open your Bible to Deuteronomy 6. We'll be there in just a moment. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And, uh, that is not the right lesson. David, that is not... There's one called something about self. If you can find that one and put that one on in there, I'd appreciate it. All right. So what happens when you write a sermon, that was the sermon that I started writing. I went, this is not going where I want it to go. And so I started over and started preaching something else. But let's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 while we get that one up. Deuteronomy chapter 6. There is a, a very well-known statement here that's part of the law that every Jew would have memorized. This was the, this was the passage of Scripture that Jews would even wear in the frontlets on their forehead. So they would have little boxes in their certain services that they would do, and they would have what they called the schema uh, on, in the, on a little scroll rolled up in this little box on their, on their forehead. And it's this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your... is so fundamental to everything we do and everything we are and everything the Jews were that it is worth memorizing for ourselves. Because it is the very words that were that was used by Jesus to summarize pretty much everything we're supposed to be doing. Turn over to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and we've got this idea presented. Mark chapter 12, Jesus quotes that passage of Scripture. We'll start in verse 28. It says, One of the scribes approached... When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is most important of all? Now, stop there and notice. This is one of the rare instances where Jesus isn't being asked a question and we're added this little tidbit that says, because they were trying to trip him up. They were trying to test him. They were trying to make Jesus look bad. This question seems to be a genuine question Asked by somebody who is impressed with Jesus and impressed with the kind of answers that Jesus gives. Perfect. Thank you, David. Here's Jesus' answer. The most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commands greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, you have correctly said that he is one, and there is no one else except him, and to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God, and no one dared to question Jesus any longer." In these two passages of Scripture, we have essentially the foundation for everything we are. And I don't just mean everything we are as Christians, but everything we are. Every understanding we need to have about ourselves is based off of this foundation. And I hope to show you that before we're done. Now, that is not the way the world thinks about these ideas. For instance, if we're looking at a history of the way the world has presented how we should understand ourselves, back in medieval time, man believed that to better understand us as people, to better understand the way we think, the way we behave, the way we act, we needed to understand what's called the cosmic order. Okay, understand our place in the universe, how the universe works, and even, if you're on the more spiritual side of that, God's role in creating the cosmic order and God's role in our lives. Modern man believes that understanding of self comes from having our, uh, this process of observation and thought, really the scientific method. 
A naturalistic explanation of life will help us understand everything we need to know about ourselves, everything we need to know about the way we think, act, and live. Postmodern man, so modern man is more the World War II generation, mid 1900s uh, time frame. Postmodern man teaches that individuals have the freedom to construct their own identity. And the emphasis is really in modern, postmodern thought that there must be more diversity and that diversity and tolerance leads to a utopian reality. If you want to have the best possible outcome and the best possible society, the more diverse that society is and the more tolerant that society is, that's where you come to the best type of self. Now we're in late modern. So we, we had postmodern, now there's late modern, and late modern view emphasizes individualization. Okay, really it's this idea of you have to constantly ask, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And kind of create this narrative around that idea. And so there's this push in modern psychology and modern uh, ways of thinking that you need to create what they call the narrative of self which means what is the story that leads you to where you are, and if you can reconstruct everything that has made you who you are today, you can also better understand who you will be tomorrow. And having that narrative of self will get you there. Now, there is truth in all four of these views. And there are a lot of holes in all four of these views. And the primary hole you find in all four of these views is that they've left out the foundation we just read about. Because what man is really about is loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind, and all of your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. That really is what creates the best understanding of self is what is your relationship with God and what is your relationship with your neighbor. If you understand those two things, you can understand self perfectly. And that is what Jesus is teaching, and that's what you find in these passages of Scripture. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your strength. I've always thought it's interesting that Jesus adds to the schema. I don't know if you noticed that. So the schema had three things. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Jesus adds with all of your mind, and I think that reflected sort of a cultural uh, understanding of that your, your, uh, your, so, or your, your mind also, in, or your heart also included your thoughts. And so you had emotion and thought. And so Jesus kind of separates the two ideas in the way that he presents us. He essentially says, by very nature, the way we are created is that we are physical beings, that we are emotional beings, that we are mental beings, and that we are spiritual beings. And so you start pulling that out of this passage of Scripture, that's essentially what Jesus builds for us, is that we as people have four parts that make us who we are. And if we have a better understanding of who we are physically, who we are emotionally and mentally, and who we are spiritually, we will have the best understanding of how we are to function in this life and how we are to build a life toward the future. And that's what I want to talk about this evening. Let's start with the physical self, because I think that's probably the easiest for us to understand, because that's what we see in the bathroom mirror every day. It's what we spend a lot of time primping and making look pretty. So we are created with bodies. I think we all know that. That's what's taught from the very beginning. God created Adam and Eve. He formed Adam out of the, uh, out of the ground. He made Eve some miraculous way out of the rib of Adam. And that Eve woman became bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And you've got these two created beings physically. They have bodies. They exist in the physical world. And they are... Uh, functioning and moving and living and taking care of the garden and doing all the things that God tells them to do. 
And in these bodies, we're going to look at quite a few passages of Scripture tonight, so just go ahead and get ready to turn pages. James chapter 2, verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. We've got this idea of we our bodies are made alive in some way. And James identifies that with the spirit. Okay? The spirit is a part of making us who we are. But I would argue that part of what we're going to see in this lesson is that we are who we are because we have both body and spirit. Together they make us alive. There is a sense in which we will retain our bodies in the resurrection. Okay, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, it says this about our resurrection bodies. It says, uh, verse 2, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. So we don't know much about it. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And I point that out because we know that Jesus' body resurrected. Jesus' body still reflects, or somehow Jesus' existence still reflects his body. And we see that in all the appearances of Jesus in some form or another. And that, that, that is also used and talked about even by Paul over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which, which admits that our resurrected bodies are not the same as our current bodies in some way, but our current bodies are involved in it in some way. Verse 50, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can... Corruption inherit incorruption. So this body, as it is, will not go to heaven. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery, he says. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. Somehow this body is changed, but this body is still part of it. I can't tell you how that works. I have no idea. The Apostle John didn't even know because he says we don't yet know what it'll be like. All we know is it will be like him. We will be like him. And so in whatever way Jesus' body is connected with his current existence, so my body will be connected with my current existence. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to point that out because I think we get this idea that the physical body doesn't matter. It is just a, a, a tent that is thrown away at some point and no longer has any role to play in anything. And therefore the physical body just isn't isn't part of what we need to be concerned about. And I would argue with that. There is a sense in which the body is still a part of what we do. Not only that, we know that we can sin with our bodies. Our bodies are not, you know, there, there was a, a, an idea by the Gnostics back in the first and second centuries that because the spirit was different than the body, what you did in the body didn't affect the spirit. Well, that, that's not true at all. And we're taught constantly through Scripture that we can sin or make mistakes with the body. First, uh, chapter 6 of Romans, verse 11. So you too consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it, your mortal body, to sin as weapons of unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God. Uh, all the parts of yourselves as weapons of righteousness. Well, that, in the context, is talking about your mortal body. Your mortal body can be used as a weapon for sin, or it can be used as a weapon in God's service for righteousness. Your body matters. 
Your body is a part of what God created as you. We learn over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we can even sin against our body, not just with our body, but we can cause our bodies to have the consequence, bear the consequences of sin. Here it says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. And it goes on to say in the next couple of verses here, do you, don't you know that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. You're going to tell me your body doesn't matter? When your body, your mortal body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That your mortal body, in the context here, is what was bought by God? Your body belongs to Him. Your physical body, your physical self, matters. This is why you love the Lord your God with all your strength, your body. There's also a sense of the emotional and mental self, and I'm grouping them together because in Deuteronomy 6, they're grouped together. Jesus separates them there when he lays it out that you have heart and you have mind, but oftentimes in ancient literature, those two things were joined together. Your heart and your mind were the same thing. And we know that God created us as emotional beings. God himself has emotions. Okay, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, we know, just because we've studied it in this quarter, God was grieved that he ever made man, right? God felt grief. God felt ups- or being upset. Turn with me over uh, to Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. That's not a book we turn to very often. This might be the first time I've ever had you turn to Zephaniah in four years of preaching here. Uh, it's just not a book we go to often. But uh, there's, a, there's a verse in Zephaniah chapter 3 that I think is, is pretty extraordinary. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, it says, the Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. First of all, just the idea of God sitting on his throne, thinking about you and me, and singing as a result of it because it brings him such joy, is that not an incredible thought? I mean, I I love that my God sings when he thinks of me, should, hopefully. He sings when he thinks of me. But we are made in the image of God, right? Right? We're made to be like God. And so it makes sense that if God made us to be like him, we have the same range of emotions that he does. That there are times when we grieve. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, is part of the Beatitudes where Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There are times when we are brought to times of mourning. There are times when we deal with anxiety. Peter tells us, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We are those who also experience the same range of emotions, whether that be mourning and anguish and being upset and anger, all the way to the other end where we are rejoicing and happy and thrilled, we get to experience all that too. But just like we are emotional beings, we are also beings who think, beings who are, who are constantly in thought about various things. And that makes sense because God is too. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For who knows a person's thought except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God 
except the Spirit of God. We think, and God thinks. And we are beings that are constantly engaged in thinking and dwelling on, and, and we're even told to control our thoughts. Second uh, Corinthians tells us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Whatever is good and honorable and just and pure and lovely, think, dwell on, meditate on these things. So we're to be the kind of people who are thinking people. And we need to understand that's a part of what God made us to do. And so if we understand that that is part of who we are, it helps us to have a better understanding of what we should be engaged in. But just like our bodies can be used for sin, so can our emotions and our thoughts. Matthew chapter 5, back in the Sermon on the Mount again, soon after Jesus gave those beatitudes we mentioned a minute ago, Jesus has this long discourse where he talks about how our thoughts and our emotions, if they are left unchecked, lead us towards sin. We're told there, starting in verse 21, you've heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Angry. Those who are, who are angry, because angry will lead to some sort of, uh, of distreatment of your brother and sister. It will cause you to not love your neighbor as yourself as we referred to earlier. And so that anger, that emotion, leads us to sin. Following along with that, he says in verse 27, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Those are thoughts. That when we leave our thoughts unchecked and uncontrolled, they lead us towards sin. They lead us to fail the standard that God has given us. And therefore, we have to be people who are aware, not just of the fact that we have a body that can be used for good and evil, but we have a heart that can be used for good and evil, and we have a mind that can be used for good and evil. And if we understand that all of that is part of who we are, it helps us have a better understanding of how we're supposed to live. But we're also spiritual being. And I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here about this idea, but the most of the world does not even consider this to be part of the equation. And this, I think, leads to a lot of the trouble we see happening in the world with so much depression and so much discontentment and so much dissatisfaction about life and so many issues that people have where they're unable to forgive and unable to move forward and unable to, to deal with the difficulties of life. It's because they've never had an understanding of the spiritual self that God created in each of us. And if they understood it, it would help. And we're told back in creation, after God gave us bodies and formed us out of the dust of the ground, what did he do? He, it says there, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And we have a lot of conjecture as to what that could possibly mean. Well, I'm going to tell you, it kind of defines it for us over in the book of Job. Now, you have to be careful with this because this isn't Job speaking, it's Elihu and if you know who, uh, anything about the book of Job, Elihu is the young man who kind of uh, pompously jumps in there, and uh, at least in my opinion. Some people think Elihu is kind of a messenger of God of sorts to set things straight, but I think he's, he's um, uh, of lesser quality, more of an arrogant presentation of truth. But that doesn't necessarily discount what he says here based of what they understood this idea of breathing into man was. It says, verse 8, Job 32, verse 8, But it is the spirit of a person, the breath from the Almighty, that gives anyone understanding. That breath from the Almighty is identified as our spirit. And I think that that's part of what we were intended to be from the very beginning. We are body and spirit. 
So man has this soul and spirit that's talked about oftentimes through Scripture, like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which talks about the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword, able even to divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit. Now, don't ask me, how do you divide soul and spirit? I don't know. I think the point there is it is so sharp that it is like scalpel sharp, and it is able to make precise cut in a way that that God can control it and make it work. It can cut what shouldn't be able to be cut apart, right? That's the idea that's presented there. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we as people, as creation, have both soul and spirit. And we're told elsewhere in Scripture that we have a spirit or a soul. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus, in giving caution, tells them, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Notice there, body and soul. Body and soul go together. We're told that death comes when body and soul separate. Again, back over in James chapter 2 and verse 26. And we're told that when uh, uh, that, that there's this separation of death of some sort, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, you've got the same idea that the soul upon death will return to God. And then Psalm 146 and verse 4, Psalm 146 and verse 4, when the breath or when the spirit leaves him, he returns to the ground on that day his plans die. And so you've got this idea of, essentially, life is over. When the body and the soul separate, life is over. And there's all sorts of discussion as to what life looks like at that point. When the body and the soul and the spirit are separated, is there still a continued consciousness? Is that a time of of essentially blackout until the judgment day when the body and the soul are reunited in some form or fashion? And I don't have the answers for all that. What I can tell you is God, when he created us, created us body and spirit, put those two things together, and he says that when those two things separate, life is over. That's clear. That's what we know based on Scripture. And there's, I think, an importance for being able to understand that those two things go together. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. I know I've gone really fast, and I've turned you to a lot of passages and probably read it before you got there. I apologize about that. I try not to do that often. I do want to give you a few moments to turn to the next several passages. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to read verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. So then, dear friends... Since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Purity or impurity of flesh and spirit. The expectation by God is that we be both clean in our bodies, and in our inner man. Maybe that's a different way of wording it, but hopefully you know what I mean. Our spirit. That we have to be clean entirely. There is not a, your body doesn't affect yourself. Even though that's what the world currently would would have you to believe. That who you are is something different than the flesh container that you are in. And that what happens to your flesh doesn't affect your yourself, your inner self, the person that you are. I would argue the Bible teaches differently. The Bible teaches that the, the, the way you behave in your flesh and the way that you act in your spirit are one and the same. And that we are to prepare ourselves in both ways for our meeting with God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Again, I want to give you a moment to get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Verse 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, set you apart completely, make you something special completely. God is going to take the whole you and make that designated or named or set apart. And in case that weren't clear, he says this, And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole soul, spirit, uh, your, your whole uh, spirit, the inner man, or mind and, mind and heart, and your body, your physical, be kept sound and blameless. Because our reunion with God is not merely a spirit before God's presence, but in some form or fashion, it is the whole us that goes before God. Now, I don't understand how all that works. I don't understand how corruptible can be made incorruptible and the temporal can be made eternal and that, that uh, the, the mortal can be made immortal. I, I don't have a clue what that looks like. But that doesn't change the truth of it. That my body, my soul, and my spirit are all going to be presented before God someday. And when that happens, I am to be of sound behavior and blameless. We cannot separate the parts of man as if one part is more important than another part, or as long as we focus on this, that it will make sure everything else is done. They are so intertwined that we cannot separate them. The body is affected by the mind and our emotions, and the mind and emotions are going to be affected by your spirit or your soul, the spiritual side of you, and the health of the body and sin in the body, all that affects the spirit, the spirit and the soul. It all works together. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of this makes more sense than we normally think about. The illustration I normally like to use is, is I'll take somebody who's probably not used to... Um, uh, any sort of uh, public speaking or, or doesn't like the idea of public speaking. So I'm going to pick on Dallas for a minute because I know Dallas does not like public speaking at all, okay? But if I were up here and all of a sudden I started getting some big stomach cramp and I felt like I needed to step down and remove myself from this congregation or it was going to get messy in a lot of different ways, and I said, all right, I've got to go. Dallas, you come up and finish. And I walked out. What's that going to do to Dallas? First of all, I don't know that Dallas would leave his seat. Dallas might fall over. Like, he, he's just not, he, and not, not out of passing out. He's just hiding. Like, he, 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 he's out, right? He, he's not going to do it. But we understand the way that works of, of if I were to do that, would that create an emotional effect in Dallas? Absolutely. Nerves, uh, anxiety, right? All sorts of ways in which Dallas is going to have all sorts of emotion, some of them probably negatively directed toward me for calling his name in the first place. He might feel those, some of those right now anyway. And, and, uh, but, but, I mean, he, he is, he's not going to be a happy camper, do you think that's going to affect the way he thinks? All those emotions he's feeling, is that going to affect the way he thinks? Do you think the anxiety he would feel would help him have organized and ready-to-go thoughts or would prevent them? Probably prevent them. Now, I know Dallas well enough that you sit down one-on-one -on -one and Dallas can explain things to you in a way that you're like, huh, I've never thought about it that way. That's amazing. Like he's piecing these passages together and pulling all of these things together and making a great case for some idea that he's, he's sharing with me from Scripture. It's not that Dallas is unprepared in his thought, but the emotion would jumble his thought and make his mental thinking, his mental part, unclear. Do you think it would have a physical effect on Dallas? Start sweating? 
Start shaking a little bit. Mouth dries out. Right? I mean, all of it's intertwined. When you have an emotional reaction, it can produce a physical effect. You have a physical effect, it can create an emotional reaction. Everything that we are is intertwined. And that is easy to see when we think of it in the physical, mental, and emotional side. I would argue that a big part of that is also spiritual. It's just a much, it has just as much effect on the way that we feel, the way that we think, and the way that we live. And that we need to give more attention to the part that probably in our world is most neglected, the spiritual side of man. We will only truly be complete if we are focusing on health in all of the areas that make us who we are. And then we will feel incomplete whenever we lose sight of one of those. I would argue, and I'm not a psychologist, and I understand that before I even make this statement, but I would argue that many of the issues that our world is facing when it comes to mental health has a lot to do with spiritual disease. That because they are not right with God, because they do not know the God of all comforts, because they do not know the Prince of Peace, because they do not know hope the way the Bible teaches hope, because they do not know forgiveness the way the Bible teaches forgiveness, because they do not know that guilt can be erased and that consciences can be made clean and that life can be made right through the blood of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross. Because they do not know that God has taken care of our present and made hopeful and wonderful our future. When they don't have any of that, they have no reason to have emotional health and mental health, and physical health. When life is merely an accident, and you just happen to come to be through a series of millions of years of evolution, and you have no greater purpose but to live on this earth and die on this earth, and then it is all over with, when that's the best you got, where is the solution for life's ills? Where do you find comfort in those situations? When you do not have what the Bible teaches about how to love your neighbor as yourself, and the world is telling you love yourself first, where do you see the kind of relationships in the world the way you see them in the church? The way they should be in the church at least. If you can understand that the spiritual part of our lives is as important as every other part of our lives, it helps put all of life in balance. And it helps us see that God is doing something to help us better understand. Now, again, I'm not by any means arguing that as long as somebody becomes a Christian, it solves all of their mental health issues. That's not my my point. But I will tell you, people who don't know Jesus have reasons for mental health issues that people would, who do know Jesus don't. Doesn't mean there aren't other things to struggle with. Again, not my point. But my point is, we create problems in the world when we don't take Jesus to the world. We create difficulties in people's lives when we don't introduce them to the one who loves them enough to sacrifice himself for them and make their life better. And so I would argue for us as people, if you want to love your neighbor as yourself, you need to teach people about the God who loves them. If you want to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength, then you must love him completely and take everything that you are into his presence and let that be 
his. And I'm going to tell you, I, I have seen it many, many times over the years, how many times I have seen Christians who carry and hold on to these secret sins in their lives and they hold on to them because they're like, well, but this part of my life doesn't really matter as long as I'm worshiping regularly, as long as I'm doing this. And they, they have a very unbalanced view of the fact of every part of you belongs to him, not just the parts you want to belong to him. And that when it comes to appearing before Jesus one day, he will judge not just what you did in the church building, but he will judge you heart, soul, mind, and strength. Did you love God with everything? If not, tonight's the night to fix it. You might need to be baptized into Christ. If you've not done that, you've never had your sins washed away and your guilt taken away from you. Tonight's the night you can do that. We would encourage you to do that. If you want to know more about that, we want to sit down and study with you. Let us help you. Or maybe, maybe you've got these pieces of your life you've held in reserve for yourself. You've never really handed them over to God. Hand them over to God. Because God is going to judge all of you, not just the parts you want him to see. So let God have everything. And if you need prayers or you need to get something right in your life,